Hey folks, Todd Colburn here with your Aerospace Structure Series. This lecture is on weld strength, and we're talking specifically on static strength of welds. So the basic idea when we're welding materials together is that we're going to fuse these two materials into a single homogeneous material. Okay? We're hoping that our uh, so our welding rod needs to match the parent material, and the goal is that the welding the uh, electrode material is as strong or stronger than the parent material. Okay, and generally they're constructed that way. Other than that, our analysis is going to basically proceed as normal. We're going to need to check both the electrode itself and the parent material. Although the way that you, we are going to do that is uh, can allow us just make a, a fairly simple check. Okay, uh, let's see, we said this. So what happens is um, when we weld a material, there's a lot of heat involved and that can tend to relieve or remove any benefits from annealing or cold working or heat treating the material, which means it can affect the properties. Uh, there's some materials where the welding will uh, basically perform full strength, but generally not if that material has been heat treated or has undergone some kind of specialized uh, treatment to get better properties. Okay, so we're going to need to be watching out for that. All right, so first let's focus on steel welds. There's a lot of been work, work has been done on steel welds, and the American Welding Society has laid out a code for how to evaluate the strength of low carbon uh, carbon and uh, or low carbon and low alloy steels. Basically, uh, steels will use electrodes like this, where the electrode is specified by roughly the yield strength of uh, or the uh, ultimate strength of the weld. Like an E70 weld is a 70 ksi FTU for that weld material. This is a little table showing both the FTU and FTY for some of these electrodes. And um, basically what we're going to do, our first step is going to be go and look at what is the FTU of the electrode in that case. We'll then go and figure out what is the strength of the parent material. And according to the uh, American Weld Society, we're going to use the FTY of the parent material. All right. And then we're going to determine our weld shear and tension allowables using these two formulas. For tension, we will specify 60% of the parent yield strength as the uh, strength of the weld. And for shear, which means any fillet weld, because we're assuming those are uh, kind of a pseudo shear for regardless of the loading, we're going to take two values. We're going to take the minimum of 30% of the electrodes FTU, we'll check that value, We'll take 40% of the parent materials FTY, and we'll take the minimum of those two values to approximate our shear strength of the weld. So once again, this is our process for low carbon and low alloy steels. Okay, now if we have a medium or a high carbon steel, then it's more likely that we will need advanced procedures to maintain strength. But we're going to use the exact same process, except we're going to require re heat treating of the material after welding. Now, it is true that some materials may uh, experience full strength even after uh, if you don't reheat treat, but really that needs to be proven, not guessed. And so uh, if you want to do that, you need to verify through testing that that is true. Okay. Now, if we get uh, aluminums, aluminums can vary, uh, the weldability of aluminums can vary a lot based on the alloy, alloy composition. And so the uh, certifying authorities, the AWS, the SAE, and the ASM have gotten together and come up with a rating system to rate welds on their weldability. Basically, if something is rated A, that means it's generally weldable using normal methods. If it's rated B, then this is still true, but we may require some specialized methods. If it's welded, if it's rated C, it's got more limited weldability. It probably needs special techniques and test verification. And if there's an X 
then it is really not recommended for welding. I work with a number of materials that are rated B and C that still are readily weldable uh, once the special techniques have been employed. However, basically, uh, uh, whether it's A or C, we should never assume that the uh, weld will receive full strength unless we have some kind of additional data gen uh, showing that that's true. For an A weld, it's probable that if you reheat treat, you will uh, get full strength. For these others as well, we're really going to want to reheat treat to demonstrate that we've maintained strength. We need to see some data that shows that that alloy has been successfully welded and maintained the strength after that process. And uh, so basically, we're going to do that. We're going to uh, actually, I'll specify that in just a moment. So, ratings of common aluminum alloys, uh, MMPDS calls 6061 an A rateability, so it's readily weldable. 2024 is rated as a B and 7075 rated as a C. So 7075 really requires some special techniques. However, um, there are a number of folks that are successfully welding 7075. So mainly we need to uh, review the specific 7075 alloy that we're using and uh, whether or not that's been welded and that kind of thing. Our basic process that I'm going to recommend is to make sure that our electrodes are compatible with our base material, that we're using approved weld procedures that have been uh, demonstrated and supported by testing. And then when we encounter welding on these materials with that have uh, written demonstrated processes and approvals, then we will follow the general approach of reheat treating after welding. That way we can then use, uh, assume that that gets full properties as long as we have some data showing that that has been successfully done in the past. Um, for anything that's outside, especially if you get to like a C weldability, you want to verify your allowables with testing or uh, find data that demonstrates that that's already been proven. If we get titanium, we're going to follow a similar approach. Titanium, especially pure titanium, is quite weldable and there are many titanium alloys that are also very weldable. I've run into a number of folks in the industry who feel that if they weld titanium, it's going to have full strength. But really, as a structural analyst, uh, we should uh, take a slightly conservative approach. And unless we have seen the data, we should uh, take uh, a careful approach forward. So um, once again, what we're going to do is we're going to make sure that there are written procedures for the titanium alloy that we're using. And then we will specify a reheat treat for that weld before we utilize the heat treated properties. If heat treating is not specified, then instead we can uh, stress relief anneal the parts, and then we will assume that the FTU and FTY become that annealed value after heat treating, uh, excuse me, after, uh, after welding, rather than uh, maintaining the heat treating parts. We really need to re reheat treat in order to realize those heat treating properties unless you have test data supporting something different. So that's our basic process for assessing weld strength. Once again, if we have steels, we're going to get the electroid FTU and the parent material FTY. We'll plug into the two formulas to get the allowable tension and the allowable shear strengths. For titaniums and aluminums and pretty much anything else, we're first going to demonstrate or find that we have uh, approved procedures for welding those materials, if that's been done successfully. And then we're going to specify reheat treating of the material um, in order to utilize the heat treating. Whatever heat treat that we do, that's the properties we should use. But it's the heat treat after welding, uh, not before, unless you have test data demonstrating that your part um, is not affected by that weld. Okay, so that's uh, how it works. Enjoy.